Monarch, Legacy of Monsters, an Apple original series. The world is on fire. I decided to do something about it. On November 17th. This place, it's not ours. Believe me. The most massive event of the year arrives. But if you come with me, you'll know everything, I promise. Oh my God, go, go, go! Monarch, Legacy of Monsters. Streaming November 17th, only on Apple TV+. Plus. Vaginas are absolute magic. And Ollie is here to give them the respect they deserve. That means shame-free supplements made with clinically studied ingredients to keep your pH in check. And your pleasure a priority. Put yourself on top. Go to Ollie.com today. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Hey, hey. Okay, so you guys know that I've moved my platform over to Patreon, and that's patreon.com slash Jamie Glowacki. So everything is moved there. That's where I'm now housing all my parenting content. For a dollar a month, you can access all the episodes of my podcast, but no worries if you don't want to do any financial commitment at all. We'll continue to release selected episodes here on your favorite listening platform. And just so you know, I also put up free public posts and mini podcasts on that Patreon page. So all you have to do is head over to that main page, patreon.com slash Jamie Glowacki, and you can see my free public posts and mini podcasts. Head over there to check it all out. And now on to today's show. Hey, I'm Jamie Glowacki, and you are listening to Oh Crap, I Love My Toddler, But Holy Fuck. This is a podcast for conscious parents who drop the F-bomb a lot. Hey, hey, you guys. Welcome, welcome. So today I am interviewing Elizabeth Harris, and she is the author of America is Infected and also What's Wrong with My Child. Elizabeth was on a journey. Something was wrong with her kid. She didn't know what, and she went on this huge journey. I don't even feel confident giving an intro. I'm going to give Elizabeth the mic to let her say her piece about who she is and what we're going to talk about today. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me on. My name is Elizabeth Harris and um, I own a spa in Franklin, Tennessee, and I was a biology chemistry major. I was in on a scientific background with business. I use my science a lot in cellulite reduction, skincare, and um, our world was actually pretty perfect until 2010 when I, my son came down with strep and things just went crazy. But I think I'm going to talk today a little bit about the symptoms of what that looked like when he was a toddler and how we knew there was actually something wrong with him because there was something wrong from very early on. And some of the earlier symptoms we saw of pandas and pans, which I'm going to get into that a little bit later, but was he had night terrors that were just horrible. And the good news is that we did good and bad news is that we stayed with the same pediatrician the whole time. So we weren't you know, and, and he was a very well-respected pediatrician in our area, but we would take him in and just hear, oh, that's normal. But I mean, he would wake up and just scream and cry with these night terrors and we could not get him calmed down. That was one of the early symptoms. Another one was that he would line his cars up. I remember going to the toy store one time. I turned around and he was like nine months old, barely waddling around in his onesie. And he had the cars lined up from the front door all the way to the back of the store. I mean, and at first glance, I'm just like, oh, that is really so cute. You know, looking back, that was one of the earlier symptoms. I mean, he would play with his toys at home just for hours and hours. They had Everything was just lined up perfectly. Another thing that I remember was nothing felt right when he put them on, like his socks. He didn't, you know, socks, he would change socks multiple times or jeans, it took forever to take him shopping. You know, we'd, we'd end up with two or three things and come home and at least one or two of them really wasn't right even after we'd done all that. So those were some of the really early symptoms. I remember- Let me interrupt you I, for one second. So guys, Elizabeth, what ended up happening is her son had pandas. And the reason I have her on is because pandas- I have several close friends whose child has been diagnosed with pandas. I think it's one of those newer diagnoses or we're just getting hip to it. And so there's a lot of confusion about it. The other thing I was telling Elizabeth before we started recording 
is you guys know me, you love me. I have a lot of strategies. I am a parenting expert. I'm a potty training expert, but I recently have been dealing with clients whose kids' behavior is just unexplainable. And we're doing all the strategies and the parents are really stepping up and they're doing all the things, but we're seeing this like out of control behavior. So PANDAS, can you tell us what that stands for, Elizabeth? Absolutely. PANDAS stands for Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorders Associated with Streptococcal Infections. It was first mentioned at the NIH in June of 2010, and it was immediately controversial. Of course, I didn't realize at the time that there was so much controversy surrounding this diagnosis. And, you know, as we continued on in a journey, three or four years later, I came to learn about PANS, which is Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorder. Then we realized, or the experts realized, that PANDAS is actually a subset of PANS. And so PANS is where a child basically can flare for literally anything at all, any kind of an immune response. So this is a virus, um, a food, stress, anything can cause this child to act out of control. And it can last for either three to five days if it's a virus or two or three weeks and up to six weeks if it's strep. I mean, if it's a stressful event, it's usually 24 hours. So it is so hard to put your finger on it because there are no patterns. Now with PANDAS, you can But do you have a moment? Are there moments where the child seems calm, seems like quote unquote normal or average? Like you're like, oh, cool. I'm doing this. I'm a good parent. And then all of a sudden the flare comes and you're like, what the hell just happened? Is that what it looks like? Oh, it looks exactly like that. In like 2000, I don't know. I can't remember. He was in the eighth grade. The pediatrician was like, it's behavioral. You need to take him to a behavioral therapist. So we've taken him to a behavioral therapist like 52 times. My other kids are great. And so I'm just like, okay, you know what? Fine. If I'm a bad mom, let's just rule that out. So I ordered that total transformation program. I'm not sure if you're familiar with James Lehman. I'm already like this very, I mean, I have an inventory sheet for our groceries. <laughs> My kids already were being parented that way, but this was one step further and I documented it and we did the rewards. We did the marbles. I mean, literally everything supported the school and we'd be going along, going along. And all of a sudden, one week out of the blue, this child would come home with four bus referrals in one week. And it's like, what the heck, son? You know, and, and his but you have other kids. You have other kids. kids. Mm -hmm. So you're doing a blind study. So you're not a bad mom because if you were a bad mom, you'd be a bad mom to all the kids, right? So like you knew like something's up. Something's going on. That's good to know too. Yeah. Yeah. And the and the other thing was the good news is is that the other two kids we had adopted when they were very young. And so they weren't genetically the same, you know. So Ah. instinctively you start thinking, is it genetics? And so, you know, I had to rule that out. And so we went and got this huge, I mean, it was a $10,000 genetics test, not just one of these, like, can you metabolize medication? This right, was right. like full on, you know, a spreadsheet from like, oh my gosh, he didn't have the gene for a single one of the 27 diagnoses he had been given by the time we got to the stage, nothing. So then that made it even I mean, nothing about this journey was easy, but this made it easier to realize, okay, this is environmental. And then when my adopted kids started coming down later with some behavioral issues and some odd things, and then also a boil behind one of their ears, I was like, this is infectious. I just knew it instinctively. And so it wasn't just my son that was being affected. However, he had been infected much earlier in life and did have a different genetic predisposition, but then also myself, I had complex regional pain syndrome. And what I've noticed is that like now when we scan, we we have a wellness kind of a a safety net for people that just can't get help and are really concerned about their children. Um, We try to help them get to the right places. But you know what I've noticed is in families, like there is underlying in everyone in the family. Now, some of them aren't symptomatic, but sometimes the asymptomatic kids have the highest stressor 
And so we've got asymptomatic carriers. So this is just such a complex issue that we're dealing with right now. And it is just a, a complete travesty for the American family, for the parents that try, that are vigilant, you know, that have done everything in their power to make sure they've done the right things to raise their kids in the right way. No, that's so interesting because that's what I'm running into right now. And it's been an uptick, I'd say, of the last two years. So I'm curious mm-hmm. if like something's if we're getting better at diagnosing, or maybe, I don't know, because people will come to me as a behavioral therapist and they're like, we go through all the things. And I'm like, Mm -hmm, I'm out of tricks. I'm out of tips. Mm -hmm. And then I always go, I always go to food allergies. I go to, maybe we just need to figure something else out. Let's go back though. You said your son, how old was he when he first exhibited those symptoms? Like, it sounds like it sort of manifested as OCD at first. Yeah. Like the lining up of the trucks and the well, and and sensory, even, like can't, nothing feels good on the skin. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I would even go back a little bit further than that. It's like when he was born, he was born jaundiced, even though I worked out every single day. I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. We were super happy in our marriage. You know, we were really excited to have him. And so none of those things applied when we were going through all these rehabs and facilities, like literally nothing. But he yeah. was born jaundiced. And so there's already something a little bit going on there. And then a lot of ear infections, a lot of pneumonias. And Mm. so that was kind of my, looking back and something about it was not clearing because it was like a few trips to the hospital. So I think that's a really important thing to mention here because after my husband had been in the Navy before we met. And so uh, he's born and he has these kind of physical things. And then We moved out here to Franklin and my husband's brother, ex-husband's brother-in-law came to stay with us. He was having some struggles. And after that, we started seeing a huge escalation in symptoms like psychiatric symptoms, I guess you would call them now at the time. We just thought he's having bad dreams. But But you know, as a parent, you know, as a parent, this is beyond what it should be. And a lot of kids that have uh, children with pants pandas early on will have a lot of problems with bedwetting. And, and it just, the tips won't work because it's neurological. It's in your rhesus. It's like fast forward. I know I'm jumping around here, but I think it's important to note that I actually had to find this organism in our dog. And so I took him to the vet. He was positive. Anyway, that's how we, I solved it. But at first, when our dog came to live with us, he had pneumonia and all kinds of issues. And then that went away. But then he started dribbling, you know, mm. I mean, he just couldn't. So there's a lot of that interplay with this syndrome. And I think to answer your question, the reason we're seeing it more now is not because, I mean, and I think that really, you know, kind of makes me feel a little bit you know, stressed out when I hear people say, oh, we just weren't recognizing it before because I mean, I'm almost 50 years old and I went to school, you know, I would have known if I saw a child with these symptoms, I mean, they're memorable symptoms, autism and and pandas, these things just can't be ignored. You're in a classroom, you see it. We didn't have that. It wasn't there. If it was, I mean, I don't know, but maybe one or two, maybe, but I don't remember it at all. But now it is just prevalent and it is spreading and it is continuing to spread. And I think that it's the most important message that I explain to people how this came to be in the first place, because the Gulf War syndrome was infectious. Bottom line, they came back, they had all these rare, random, mysterious symptoms of fatigue and muscle and problems. Did you say the Gulf War? Gulf War syndrome. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then these Gulf War vets, I think it was some Persian battle. I'm not trying to get into all that, but they came back, they infected their wives. Their wives came down with chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia. This was the first rash of children with autism. And so the bottom line is there was testing being done in several locations of different strains of mycoplasma, but it is not the regular mycoplasma. It's weaponized, it's pathogenic, it has been engineered to be more heat resistant, antibiotic resistant. It's just, it it, it contains EBV, some of them contain HHV6. And so basically you're dealing with a Russian cocktail of sorts, something that's man-made, something that we can't just get rid of with the traditional anything. And so once I came to understand that that was what we were dealing with, that it was a whole new day because it made sense because nothing before made any sense. I'm very logical, a business owner, business consultant, spreadsheets, like there's trends, you analyze things, you can come up with a plausible explanation as to why this changes. There was nothing. 
And so it's just like, okay, I finally can grasp why this is so tough. In between all the psych stuff, he would also have like a rash that came up all of a sudden. Seventh grade, kick him into the pediatrician, come home. Oh, that's roseola. Well, roseola is HHV6. Well, they get that when they're like toddlers. Why would you have a flare up of that? Why would you not recognize it? Because I will tell you the true test was, you know, you go through all this, but the scientist in me just couldn't let it go. The fact of like, is every doc, I mean, of course, every doctor's not in on some cover up. I, I would never believe that. And so I thought, well, the training, is it the training? Like, how do we go back and fix this? Or how do we help these families? So I went back to medical school. I went back in January and I took the first couple classes, the prereq, and then I skipped the rest of the prereqs and took infectious disease. I asked my professor, I guess this was in this March, you know, is this the training that all physicians get? Yes, this is the curriculum that they learn this material and they're tested over and board. So this is what they go out into the field with. This is what they are taught to do. And this is what they are believe is correct. And then it is so incredibly difficult, this coursework that it's like, you know, to go back and say, wait a minute, maybe I wasn't taught that. It, I can see where that would be very, very difficult. But until we can get the service providers up on this information as parents and people that have gone through this, we, it's our responsibility to step up and try to help the others that don't know what's going on. Because today, my son is completely fine. I'm completely fine. I don't have complex regional pain syndrome anymore. He doesn't have, he cannot ever catch strep again. I really don't want him to get sick. So I keep him on prophylactic antibiotics. I stay on that just because I don't want to carry anything home. But once you know what you're dealing with life, it's a whole different day. He's gone back to college, you know, and when he was 16, 17, he was driving cars through buildings, downtown Franklin. I mean, his so he was having like big psychiatric. Oh, the compulsions, because he did not get medical treatment when he needed medical treatment. He got psychiatric behavioral interventions, and that was not the correct treatment. And so, you know, it's just like this thing was allowed to grow and grow and grow. And I mean, I'm going to be honest with you, I was scared for other members of the community. And so being a responsible parent and business owner, you know, I, I just knocked on every single door. Hey, something could happen here. And so I would. All right, let's back it up though, because you just went down like a huge rabbit hole. Let's back it up so that we don't scare everybody on listening. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, we want everybody to be aware. So let's back it up because just to be clear, so you think with the Gulf War, you think there was some sort of bioengineered weapon. Do you think that's where this started? Because I know pan is a lot of people equate it with mold maybe vaccines, maybe gut issues, leaky gut, all this stuff. So I know you're very logical and you got your spreadsheet. So how did you come to that conclusion? Well, because I went back and got the labs from when he was born, all of his medical records from the vault. (laughs) I put him in a three ring binder and I created a big, you know, like I said, and I went through everything and I noticed that the ups and downs never really stopped. When he was very young, they started with the pneumonia and the ear infections and it kept going and his fevers were really high. And I noticed in one of the records, one of the doctors had noticed it it wasn't working and then switched to different antibiotics, switched to different antibiotic. And so then I just came to understand that what he had never had gone away and it slowly had shifted because they think of pandas as a misdirected immune response. So you've got a situation where a child is born with a perfectly healthy immune system, but then it keeps continuing to try to fight and fight and fight. And then slowly over time, I noticed that his physical symptoms slowly started shifting into psych symptoms. In the third grade, he was diagnosed with ADHD. He still had a few physical symptoms. So I read every single record. And so, you know, pneumonia and trouble concentrating or strep and anxiety. And it was always coupled. It would vacillate. And by the time he went to the fourth grade, he was waking up at 4 a.m. not being able to catch his breath. Well, did we go to an asthma doctor? No, we went to a therapist for anxiety. So then fifth grade diagnosed with uh, that was his onset of pandas, abrupt onset of acute OCD. But it wasn't just OCD. I mean, when he got strep two weeks after, you know, he got also paranoia. He got, felt like bugs were crawling on him. He was having auditory and visual hallucinations. 
he couldn't sleep. And so all of those things in, you know, at one time was strep. And the whole time he was growing up, I just went with it. You know, it's like, okay, so he's got ADHD. Let's get him on whatever you think we need to get him on. But he wasn't eating. He had a lot of food restriction or anorexia, which the doctor's like, oh, that's from the ADHD meds. I was like, well, you don't give him to him on the weekend and he still doesn't eat. Like it just started to not make sense to me. So I think like for my listeners, I think what I'm hearing and correct me if I'm wrong is you just have that gut feeling. Something's not right. It's above and beyond, right? Like parenting sucks. Parenting is hard. Kids can be really difficult. But there's this level, and that's what I deal with with my clients, is like, you shouldn't be dealing with this all day long. Or Mm -hmm. kids who are waking up in the middle of the night for hours. And I'm like, no, humans like to sleep. You know, like, what's going on? And again, we do the behavioral therapist stuff. We do the all the strategies, and then those aren't working. So with your son, it kind of looked like OCD. He was sick, the ear infections. And then you're saying like third, fourth, fifth grade, it started to manifest as like psychiatric. Yes. But it's very slow. Like you wouldn't pick up on it. Like you go to one doctor and they're like, Hey, let's try this. And you're thinking, okay, well, that makes sense. Yeah. That's the symptom of today. Let's treat that, you know, but then another thing to to mention is separation anxiety is really huge in kids. I mean, huge. And so he always wanted to sleep with us, you know, and that was a big no, no. And so we would put him in his bed and he would cry. And then, and I was just like, you know, this isn't right. Your child should not be crying all night. This can't be right. It's like, so when you implement the things that they tell you to do, but then in your heart, you feel like this is not right for my child, then it's time to step back and look at something different. Yeah. God, that sounds so intense. So one thing I know, what you're saying about the Gulf War is interesting because I live in Rhode Island and we are very close to Lyme, Connecticut, where Mm -hmm. Lyme disease first started. And Congress Mm -hmm. actually released paperwork saying that ticks were weaponized. And so it sounds like total tinfoil hat conspiracy theory, but ticks have been weaponized. And that's why New England, we are crazy with ticks and Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting because doctors don't believe it. There's only like two or three doctors who treat Lyme as a chronic illness. And so it's reminiscent. I'm feeling like this is almost the same thing because I know a lot of my clients who have a diagnosis of pandas, they got that from a functional medicine provider, Mm -hmm. not a conventional. And the pediatrician will keep saying it's normal. It's normal. It's normal. Now we know the pediatricians. I deal with this with potty training because pediatricians will be like, just wait till they're ready. And I have Mm -hmm. to tell people, you know, I have pediatricians as my clients with seven-year-olds in diapers. So that whole Mm -hmm. wait till they're ready. No, -hmm. we can't do that. Like, you know, pediatricians don't have time. Our medical system is so taxed that they don't really have time to delve into these things. So it sounds like you were almost playing like whack-a-mole with the take care of the ADHD. Okay. Well, now he's anorexic. Well, now what do we do now? You know, was that your experience? Oh, absolutely. You know, you bring up Lyme. I I really don't bring that up too much because of, like you said, there's already this naysayers group, but mycoplasma is the number one overlooked co-infection to Lyme disease. And so you're absolutely right. I mean, the mechanism by which these organisms work came from the same brain. I mean, it was the same philosophy. So we are dealing with essentially the same thing. And so the treatment is pretty much the same. And so it's just, yeah, it's an extension. You keep saying, is it microplasma? What are you saying? It's mycoplasma. And here's the the thing about it is mycoplasma pneumonia is known as walking pneumonia. Mm. And so they're trained that mycoplasma pneumonia is benign. It's not a big deal. And you can just, and I remember we, you know, probably all had it a few times and took them in for it. Oh, it's no big deal. It'll pass on its own. Not anymore. It will not pass on its own. It will just stay, but there's extra pulmonary symptoms involved. And so I'm just really, really encouraged that you as a behavioral therapist and with what you do, you're recognizing, Hey, there is something else going on here because you know, my experience in the last decade has been primarily that like, oh, it's the parenting, it's the mom's fault. You know, you're not doing everything. And so it's just really, really. I have moms so fucking stressed out, so fucking stressed out because they're doing everything and they're juggling fire and spinning plates. And I'm like, you guys, it shouldn't be this hard. I mean, it's hard, but it shouldn't be like wearing yourself out. So Yeah. I mean, that's definitely why I want to do on because I was like, something else is happening. And I'm passionate about diet and food. And I eat more like a paleo carnivore-ish kind of diet, definitely carbs and sugar and all that, you know, do their part. But it's so funny because something is not funny. It's odd. 
it's something else. There's something else. Monarch Legacy of Monsters, an Apple original series. The world is on fire. I decided to do something about it. On November 17th. This place, it's not ours. Believe me. The most massive event of the year arrives. If you come with me, you'll know everything, I promise. Oh my God, go, go, go! Monarch Legacy of Monsters, streaming November 17th, only on Apple TV+. Plus. So what would you look for? So my audience, you know, I deal with toddlers mostly. So I'm in like the three to four range. What would you consider is sort of beyond the beyond? I mean, like it will manifest almost in like obsessions, but you won't really recognize them because they're so young. So like, for instance- And you'll think it's cute. You're like, oh, look, they lined up all the cars according to colors. Oh my God, my kid's so smart. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And if, but if somebody pushes the car out of the way or like knocks it a little bit, they'll get kind of anxious and go back and fix it. Yeah. Or like they'll get some kind of an obsession with a sibling. I mean, it can either be like knocking on the door. They won't play with me. They won't play with me. Or just like this separation anxiety. They're always just like, you know, they've got to be with you. Or for instance, like my kid did bite some kids at daycare. He bit a few kids and he was just wild. You know, I'd never had a brother. I never had a boy cousin that I lived near. So this whole time I'm just like, oh, it's a boy. That's just like, they're just boys. And so I just continuously thought, well, he's just an excited boy. He's just an active boy. He's going to be, you know, but that wasn't it. And I remember one time they called me from the daycare. We don't know what to do. He's just it, he was like three. And I had kept, the thing is, I'd breast, he would not stop breastfeeding. He Let me ask you though, not. really quickly, does it manifest in like hating the sibling or vying for the parent's attention so much? Absolutely. Like, like you can't get enough love. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, and so, interesting. yeah. And I, I thought it was interesting because my daughter, she like just weaned herself at 10 months. He kept going until two years old and wouldn't stop because there's something with the colostrum that's actually okay. like antibodies. And so, you know, that was a big thing. And then he just trying to think he would, um, the socks thing was huge. The clothes when he was that age, you know, he could not concentrate or focus. And you don't really think about a four-year-old needing to focus, but looking backwards, it's just like, he was all over the place. And if we were all playing family game night, we'd have the neighbors come over and we would all be sitting around the table. And he just had to get up and sit on the table, or he would sit down there and do something until he was able to sit. So he would pick him up and set him on the table. We were like, okay, okay. He just would not, he wasn't able to like occupy himself. Or he had to be like the center of attention. Or Yes. Yes. Oh God, this is so interesting. I feel like this is like literally so many of the people I'm working with right now. Oh, and then like, if you try to do a disciplinary thing, that's like the correct thing and you do a timeout or you sit in the car, I mean, they will wait you out. They'll wait you out four, five, six hours or, and they'll scream, they'll scream. And you will think you are killing your child by putting them in a timeout. I mean, their reactions to like, you know, it's just like, you know, when we grew up, it was like a timeout or you're grounded and you'd march off and huff and puff. But this is like you said, next level. And it's interesting you bring that up because one of our really close friends is a family law attorney. And she's like, you know, I'm getting parents with teenagers. This is more than just like rebellion. This is like oppositional defiance order next level. And so they have names for all these things now in the DSM V5. Right, right, so right. It, but so I'm also I, like, I work with that and I, oh, cause I'm pretty strict. Like, I know you don't yeah. know all of my work, but I'm like, you know what? You don't get to bring down the house, go to your room. Yeah. You know, we have these strategies and these kids, it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. You can do consequences up the wazoo. You can do straight up punishment. I don't believe in corporal punishment, but some people spank. You, you could do everything, but these kids, it doesn't matter. So they don't care. And it's not even, it's not even them. It's just really important to know that it's not your child. That's not who so what's happening in the brain with this mycoplasma. It's an inflammation, correct? And so does the brain get inflamed and the child can't control like mm-hmm. what's behind it? I mean, this is complex, but I'm going to go there because I think that it's really important to understand that like streptococcus pneumoniae is 
the organism that inhabits our nasopharyngeal region. You know, our sinus cavities, we have a flora. We all have a flora. We talk about the gut so much, but we ignore the sinuses. And that's where the mucus originates. So if you've got a pathogenic strain of streptococcus pneumoniae in this area, then you're going to have a pathogenic mucus of sorts. It's draining down into your stomach. So you could do that all that you want, but it's just eventually going to come back. And so when you have streptococcus pneumoniae, and then you encounter streptococcus the group A strep is what it is, that you've got these two battling it out. Now, the mycoplasma pneumonia is also able to infect tissues. So now you've got two things that are pathogenic in the same area, and it's just an explosion. So let's just go back to the things that we hear, the trendy explanations, because you brought it up before, and I really want to speak to that, because it's important to realize that mycoplasma cannot metabolize simple protein. They have an incomplete metabolic pathway, so they only can feed on simple sugars, which is why when you give your child sugar and there's also mycoplasma involved, there's this huge like off-the-wall response. Because if they go only protein, really, then, then the mycoplasma kind of can calm down a little bit. But we can't keep, it's not reasonable. Like I remember going to a But doctor. that's interesting. Let me interrupt you. It's so funny because my son can have sugar all he wants. I don't see that explosive reaction that, right. you know, like some parents will be like, I gave him one M&M and he yep. was off the wall for six hours. Yeah. And so it's like, you know, you go to the the doctor and he's like, okay, no sugar, no dairy, no gluten, this for this, this for this. And I'm like, how, how is this even possible for people to live this way? <laughs> you know? And so I, in, in, after going back, okay, so red dyes, I mean, the jury's out on that. I haven't seen that as much, but stress, like stress brings up the cortisol levels. And so when you have this, you know, foreign invader living in your tissues and then your stress level goes high, the cortisol in the bloodstream causes something called chemotaxis. And chemotaxis is when an organism wants to flee. So they just burrow down deeper. So you're going to see flare-ups with that until the stress level calms down. But this is not just like, it's interesting because you can see someone under intense stress and they're like, okay, okay. And then you can see this other person that's under this much stress and they're like, oh my God, oh my God. And you're just like, okay. Oh God, it's making so much sense though. Like, Everything. I think this might be more rampant than we know because I deal with a lot of kids. Why is it one kid? And look, you had your adoptive kids, right? Like you had other <sighs> kids in your house. Why is it that one kid can be like, I mean, you could screw them to the ground and they're like, I'm good, I'm good. And then the other kid, we equate this with toddler behavior, like the red cup versus the blue cup. The red cup versus the blue cup is the stressor that makes the kid explode. And you're like, really? It was a cup. It was was a a color choice. Why are you freaking out? Yeah. They're freaking out. It just doesn't Wait, Let me ask you. So, okay. So you have this foreign invader in your, I'm stuffed up right now. So now I'm like, oh my God, do I have it? But like, so it's in your nasal passages. But you could be asymptomatic. It's not necessarily that your kid actually tested positive for strep or that they're looking like they have walking pneumonia. They could be asymptomatic, yeah? And it's just kind of living there. And here's the thing that that I just want to point out is that like, and I hate to point this out, but it's very necessary, is that there's multiple strains of mycoplasma pneumonia. I mean, multiple species. So there's like mycoplasma pneumonia, there's mycoplasma penetrans, mycoplasma fermentans, mycoplasma genitalium. And whereas before these things were just part of our bacterial flora, they weren't dangerous to say. Now, when you have one mycoplasma pneumonia that has been weaponized, whatever you want to call it, become dangerous, the other mycoplasmas in your body can also become, you know, pathogenic because there's genetic transference between organisms, even mycoplasma pneumonia and streptococcus pneumonia. So it's just like, it's a free for all. In our genitalia region, mycoplasma genitalium that used to not be dangerous now could be. And so we have no clue because they do not not test for that. That is not part of any kind of an STD panel because it's not a typical STD, you know? So we're looking at a situation where the doctors aren't even looking for the right thing. B, I learned that all the clinical trials are done on serology only, not in the tissues. So when you go in, a quick strep test, now jumping back to group A strep, is in the throat. But you could have group A strep in your anus, 
on your tip of your pen. I mean, this is like, and I'm talking about like, I remember at four or five, we went to the ocean, came back, took them in. Oh, the, the explanation, there's little mites that bit his little, I'm like, he had a swimming suit on. How is that even possible? Now perianal strep. So any kind of little, and it can get on the skin. So like, it's like, you've got to educate yourself on where group A strep can live and find a doctor that will check for it because group A will send them while these other things are bad and progressively get worse without treatment. Group A just sends them to another planet. It takes a good six weeks to get them back from that. So it's like very important to educate yourself on where it can live, what it is. It's not just the the white patches in the throat he can't swallow. When he manifested with strep that he ended up with pandas two weeks later, he actually had more stomach symptoms, really nauseous, rolling around on the ground, holding his stomach. So it's, it's a combination, yeah. Okay, you are so knowledgeable and you're going down so many rabbit holes. You guys probably get her books because we could be here for five hours, I'm sure, <laughs> like dissecting all of this. But walk us through... Number one, when you think something's wrong, you go to your pediatrician and your pediatrician is like, it's normal, but you know, and I talk about this a lot on my podcast, you Mm -hmm. know, when something's beyond the beyond, Mm -hmm. what would you do? Tell us how you healed. And I know like Elizabeth actually got a lot of antibiotics from India. She had to go an alternative route. So she's going to walk us through that and why Mm -hmm. she built a safety net so that you don't have to do that. (laughs) You don't have to be shady. (laughs) Yeah, because when it's life or death, you'll do anything for your kid, right? So that's what kind of what we're doing is set up a central place because it's impossible for someone that has not been through this and seen it. I mean, of course, getting into it, once I realized that we were going to be recovered from it, I had to work with 300 other people just to see it over and over and over to actually believe it. It's unbelievable. And so I would just actually recommend anybody to just reach out, no charge. Let's just create kind of like a historical symptom thing. And let me, I've got about 600 peer reviewed research articles that are not out there in mainstream. And what I learned, I think the most important thing was when I found out that I won't get into this, read the book, but at first I was stuck on this 19A strain of strep pneumo. Then I was like, this is a super bug. I found one thing and I called the CDC because I'm like, my son's infected with a super bug. They won't give him Levico. And she said, print out the research, take it into your doctor. I didn't realize that they really actually have to respect the fact that somebody has researched it and it's been published. So I've learned the most important infective thing is to trace your child's symptoms back to some kind of a research, which I've got a huge library I'll give you for free. Take it in, have the discussion and just like start slowly like that. And you're going to have to educate them and not from ego or anger or defiance. It's just like, there's a way that you have to talk to them. It's more like, um, you know, I'm just wondering if it might be this type right, of right, script. Right. There's a script. And it's so awful we that we have to pussy put it's around awful doctors. That we so. have to do that, but we have to do that. And it's just like a strategy. Yeah. So we kind of walk people through that. So wait, let me interrupt you for one more second. Guys, did you hear this? Because I feel like what you're saying, Elizabeth, could be so many. It's one of those weird things that like, it could be anything. And you're like, is it normal? Is it not? But what she's saying is reach out to her. She's got the peer reviewed research. Reach out to her if you're in question. So if you feel like, oh my God, this is just beyond. Like, why am I exhausted by my own child? Why is this beyond the beyond? reach out because she's got the research. Yeah, research because we have the research. And I also, in my journey, found a Zyto scanner, which I didn't believe in at all in the beginning, but it's a hand cradle. You put your hands on it, use the same science as the FBI with galvanic skin response. And I programmed it for 1600 bile stressors. And oh my gosh, that thing is spot on. So that can give us some clues as to when you go in, what research do we pull and try to connect it to that, to take them. And then also it's, sad that we have to say, oh, and and you test for it like this. So you have to work all these things in. So yeah, reach out. I mean, for us, the reason that I did believe it was because my ex-brother-in-law that had come to live with us in 2003 actually had come from the Texas prison. Anyway, that's a long story. He'd actually come from where the testing was done. When he moved in with us in 2003, a week or two after we all got deathly sick with like nine to 14 days. My little child at the time, a little toddler was two, maybe 18 months. And after that, like he just went screaming all the time, the night terrors next level. So I knew that for our family, it was true. 
plus Dr. Garth Nicholson. He's the most cited scientist in all of history, was the one who originally figured it out. There's a patent for the organism. You can learn more about him on imed.org. And so I believe that his protocol would work and it was, you know, multiple antibiotics for years. And so I knew nobody would give us that. So I just got them from another source and did the best I could. Now I wish I'd had a coach because I didn't know what I was doing, you know? So that's why we offer this now. Just support. So one of the things I shared recently on Instagram is that the state of the world is like super bumming me out. So for Christmas, I've been like festive as fuck. That's my (laughs) healing. But this interview, I'm like, well, we're just fucked, aren't we? We're just all fucked. (laughs) I mean, they're man making all kinds of shit, right? I know this can sound like super tinfoily, but we know this. We know now, even with COVID, we know like the lab leak theory was so, remember like two years ago, the lab leak theory was like nonsense. And now we know Fauci and gain of research. And like, we know we're playing with viruses and all countries are. We're playing with weaponizing them. All countries are. And now it sounds like this was like another leak. Somehow in the Gulf War, it got out and it makes sense. You know, I do like that you had said, like, it's not necessarily mold. It's not vaccines. It's not all the things that we've been hearing about. But honestly, probably just some sort of virus that they played with to, you know, do some biological warfare, which is happening. And now we're fucked. So we're, we're fucked, but <laughs> I remember when I first learned this, I mean, I cried for three days. I was like, we're affected with a, bu-. I mean, it had the most Pollyanna, never believed in a conspiracy theory, thought people were crazy because I knew it was true. I knew it was true. And so, you know, you can recover, you can heal. The way to do it is to educate yourself. You do not have to learn. I mean, I've been doing this for 10 years and now I literally just do it for at least two or three hours a morning, just learning all the research. What are they saying for what angle and what specialty and how do we go about this? So it's like, once you know, I told my son last night, I was like, thank you so much for your sacrifice because now that we we know we can always protect ourselves. We know what to do. We know where to get the stuff. We're no longer held hostage. It is such a Christmas miracle that I've been able to watch so many families get better that thought there was no hope and that they were just doomed. And plus the way that they make you feel so crazy and like you're an idiot and you, you know don't know what you're talking about. No, or you're a shitty parent. Yeah. Or you're, you're just not doing parent. the right thing. shaming. Yeah. And so it's just this freedom with the vaccines. Yes, absolutely. When you're carrying this underlying organism and then you get vaccinated, of course, you're going to get an encephalitis of source. Of course you are. Can you reverse it? A lot of it, yes. Penicillium is a very common mold. Is it dangerous to everyone? No. But penicillin, I mean, mycoplasma is inherently resistant to penicillin. So if you're in an environment and you have mycoplasma that's inherently resistant to penicillin, but you're killing off other stuff, is it a problem? Yes. So there is an explanation. And I think that the hope is in finally realizing, oh my gosh, now it makes sense. You know, all these things make sense. There's this one variable we didn't know was here. Now we know, what do we do about it? And you can do something about it. And then I would just implore everyone to learn about it and then pay it forward. That's what I'm doing. Cause I cannot believe that I was able to figure it out and get my child better and our whole family better. And it was a miracle. And so that's just, it is a moral and ethical responsibility to do this for the rest of my life and educate as many as I can, because life is great now. I lost my 6,000 square foot home. We lived in seven or eight homes. My son was a juvenile. I mean, all kinds of stuff. And today we just bought another home for the first time own a home. I mean, a second spa we built in Green Hills. I mean, I'm doing some consulting again. It's just like a complete, there is life, you know, and life is not supposed to be like this 10 or 12 years I spent floundering around. So the hope is that maybe I can save you eight years. Well, I think too, like the point I'd like to bring home to you guys is that if you feel like your entire existence is wrapped up Mm -hmm. in your child's behavior, something's off. And just by listening, everybody listening to me right now, you follow my strategies. I know you're conscious parents, you're good parents, you're doing all the things. And if it's still not working, let's look for other answers. My mind is spinning because I cannot even fathom the knowledge you have. Like you've spewed some words into your mic. Like I shut down at like science (laughs) at that level. I'm like, understand what she's saying anymore. But listen, reach out to Elizabeth because she's done the work. Let her help you. And it doesn't have to be overwhelming. So I feel like this podcast may have been very overwhelming because we went down so much so fast. But if you reach out to her and see what she has to offer, 
I think it will help you. And you don't have to be overwhelmed. Absolutely. Right. Elizabeth, where wellness. can we find you? What's wrong wellness.com. You can just go there and try to contact me. We have an app, we have a portal, so I can answer questions in there. And there's all kinds of resources. It's overwhelming when you first hear it, but honestly, like after we have a conversation or two, it's just going to all start clicking and then you're just going to come to know it. It's really awesome to watch someone's eyes open and then feel empowered because that's what I want to do is empower you to not feel less than a medical professional or somebody else because you don't know what's what. Would you say you healed pandas or are you managing it? Because everybody I know is just trying to manage it. I would say that we healed pandas. I will say mm -hmm. that you will always have the confused antibodies. And so that means that like, if you catch an organism you had while you were affected, that those antibodies will launch and you will get those symptoms. It's kind of a catch 22, but it's not hard to manage. Once you've got it in the clear, you know, they just can't catch strep or we figure so out what that, that's how you're managing it. You're not managing your son's behavior anymore and you're no. not managing his flares but you're like, we can't catch strep. He tried to come off the antibiotics and he caught strep. And I was like, and it was back to schizophrenia. And I was like, what are you going to do? I'm just, uh, I'm going to wait it out. And like, my fiance is like, oh my gosh, we've got, and I'm like, we're not doing anything. We're not doing shit. <laughs> we're going to wait, wait it, out. it out. And that's all it takes. And now he's up at six and back to work. I mean, it's just incredible to watch. You don't have to do that. That work is not yours to do yeah. as a parent. That's amazing. Thank you surreal. so much for having you on. And I'm sure we're going to get a lot of feedback and I might have you back on. That would be wonderful. And I'm happy to break it down into segments, however you want me to deliver the information. Yeah, this was a lot. This was a lot. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and this yeah. is only a fraction of your story. So yeah. um, I so appreciate you. And I just, again, you guys, I can't state it enough. I don't know what happened in the last couple of years, but maybe we're all just infected, but Kids are reaching a different level. It's beyond, beyond. And if you feel exhausted, we're all tired. We all are underslept. Parenting is hard. But when it gets to a certain level, you shouldn't be focused all day long on managing your child's behavior. And so I think this is just one more thing that we can look to and like, what is it? And so thank you, Elizabeth. I so appreciate you. Thank you so much for doing what you do. We need so many more of you. All right. Very good, you guys. So it's whatswrongwellness.com and her books are America is Infected, What's Wrong with My Child, and your Instagram is Elizabeth Harris Author. Yes? At Elizabeth Harris Author. And I would just strongly encourage you to order the book, read the book, because you will learn. And like what I just regurgitated in 30 minutes, you get to slowly kind of come to the understanding of. And so I highly encourage you to read the book first and then reach out and we'll have a conversation. Awesome. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, bye, everyone. Just a reminder, if you need additional resources, I have Oh Crap Potty Training. I have Oh Crap, I Have a Toddler. Those books are available everywhere you want to find a book. <laughs> you can also go to my website, jamieglowacki.com, where you can book private sessions with me, buy any of my courses. Those are really geared towards potty training help. And also I'm on Instagram. I'm not on Facebook anymore and I'm not on Twitter. I'm on Instagram, jamie.glowacki. And I do a lot of lives and uh, usually posting a lot of good information. So those are extra resources for you. And as always, rock on. Have an awesome day.